Hello, I'm Clovis Kasali, and this is Middle East Matters. Coming up on the show. Syrian troops continue their northwest offensive, causing many casualties and the mass displacement of civilians. We'll bring you a rare report from that area cut off from the world. Conservatives set to cruise to victory in Iran's parliamentary elections. This as thousands of moderates and reformist candidates are banned from running in the ballot. And finally, we'll be taking you to the breathtaking landscapes of Wadi Rum. Jordan's desert has become the place to film for Hollywood superstars. But first to Syria, where the army's offensive has led hundreds of thousands of civilians to flee their homes in the northwest of the country. Idlib province and Aleppo have long been strategic targets for Bashar al-Assad's troops. Our colleagues from France 2 got rare access to the area, but had to be escorted by the army. As the United Nations urged once again for humanitarian corridors, operations have resulted in widespread destruction, as you'll see in this report. Syrian troops head to the front line in Idlib province. In the near distance, they're battling rebel and jihadist groups. Backed by Russian air power, they've advanced through an area that was still under opposition control at the beginning of the year. See those trees over there? That's our most recent position. For us, recapturing this zone is a key step towards recapturing the whole country. Idlib is just a question of time, and we're very patient. Reinforcing the front are these young soldiers. 21 years old, they evoke the government's discourse regarding the war. We are the youth, the future of this country. There are terrorists from foreign countries who wanted to take us back to the Middle Ages. Yes, we had to take up arms at a young age, too young even, but it was to defend our land, our country. Among their recent territorial gains, Marat al-Numan, for the army, it's strategic for its location along the M5 highway. And it's also symbolic. The city was one of the first major centers of protest against President Bashar al-Assad when the uprising began in 2011. Once home to tens of thousands of people, it's now a ghost town. After months of bombing by Assad and his Russian allies, Meanwhile, the country's military crisis is being compounded by its economic crisis. At the store in Damascus, sugar has just been delivered. The government has started rationing subsidized food with these smart cards, which track and cap purchases. Without this card, I would have paid much more for this, three times more. We expected these shortages. We noticed the jump in price for these basic necessities. These subsidies help us breathe a little bit. A government move to attenuate public anger amid dire economic conditions. Conditions that 50-year-old Kausar Maison has now learned to live with. Her husband has disappeared, kidnapped, she says, and her son injured. We can forget the years of famine or food shortages, but when you lose a loved one, that's something you can never forget. And we've lost many. Every family, every neighbor has lost two, three, sometimes five people. An entire generation has been lost. For now, life in Syria for many remains a daily fight for survival. But after nine years of grueling war, sparked by the government's repression of what began as peaceful protests, many are now wondering how much longer the fight will last. Houthi rebels and Yemen's internationally recognized government have finally agreed to a long-delayed prisoner swap, a breakthrough in talks that could possibly be a first step towards an end to the violence. War in Yemen began in 2014, and France 24's Charles Emtaz and Olivier Jobard were there recently for an exclusive report. They made the journey with a group of Ethiopian migrants who, hoping to reach Saudi Arabia, fell in the hands of smugglers in Yemen. Here's a clip from their report that you can find on our website. Oh, 
When they arrive in Yemen, migrants step into a different universe, governed by tribal rules and far removed from any official authority. Here, the migration trade takes place in the open, like in this makeshift camp, right next to the coastal road. Iran's supreme leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei says casting a vote in the upcoming parliamentary election is a religious duty, but many in the country are deprived of their favored candidates. Thousands of reformists and moderates are banned from running in the ballots, and the population seems disillusioned with devastating U.S. economic sanctions. Many on the streets of Tehran have lost faith in their representatives. In fact, polls suggest that the number of voters who will stay home on Election Day could reach a record of almost 80 percent. Neither the conservatives nor the reformers are trustworthy. They only care about votes. Our elections are useless. A backdrop to the elections is the Iranian economy suffering under U.S. sanctions and the government's repression of nationwide demonstrations, which broke out last November. This election is just a show so the world thinks that our leaders are chosen by the nation, when that's not really the case. Contributing to the apathy of voters, some 7,000 candidates, more than half of the total, have been told they cannot run, disqualified by the all-powerful Guardian Council for not obeying the Islamic establishment. Many of those disqualified are reformists who support Iran's president, Hassan Rouhani. The 71-year-old, whose term ends in August of next year, is still urging people to turn out to vote and has ruled out resigning in the wake of the election. My resignation would not really make sense. We have made promises to the people and we will continue to fulfill them despite the economic situation. But that task will be a tall order for Rouhani, with a government expected to be dominated by conservative hardliners. His position weakened by the United States withdrawal from the 2015 nuclear deal and the reimposing of economic sanctions. Its breathtaking landscapes seem out of this world. Jordan has been the setting for dozens of Hollywood blockbusters. The splendid archaeological city of Petra was the setting for Indiana Jones, while more recently the Wadi Rum Desert welcomed the Star Wars crew. As Monty Francis tells us, it's not just all about the scenery, but also down to money. The Wadi Rum Desert in Jordan, a jewel of the Middle East, Listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, it draws tourists from across the globe. Its colorful landscapes have also been a major draw for the film industry. From Lawrence of Arabia in 1962, Now you can either accept that, to recent blockbusters, including The Martian, starring Matt Damon. 
This will come as quite a shock to my crewmates. Star Wars. We spotted the fugitives. Hey, can you make me a prince? And last year's live action adaptation of Disney's Aladdin. It's like when we were in uh, Wadi Rum, um, I mean, just to walk out, you, you yeah. experience the wonder and awe that you want to infuse the character with. Here we are at Wadi Rum. It's also the setting for the much anticipated remake of Dune from director Denis Villeneuve to be released later this year. During filming last year, one of the stars, Josh Brolin, couldn't resist sharing the view on social media. Thank you. Beautiful, peaceful, quiet, ominous. Jordan has welcomed Hollywood. In 2003, officials established the Royal Jordanian Film Commission with the goal of making the country what it called a huge outdoor studio. Jordan has offered Hollywood more than just breathtaking landscapes. If a film studio's on-site expenses exceed $1 million, Jordanian authorities have offered a 10 to 25 percent cash rebate on their expenses in the kingdom. The incentive seems to be working, attracting 29 big-budget films in just the past five years. That's it for me and Middle East Matters this week. Join us again soon and stay tuned to France 24. Your needs are changing and so is France24.com. With articles, reports, the latest international news, all our programmes available on replay, together with live broadcasting 24-7. Intuitive, fast and available in four languages. France24.com. Liberté, égalité, actualité.